Our next speaker is coming to us straight from Australia, and um, she will be talking about the importance of quality engineering and how to implement uh, QA processes, especially when you don't have a um, dedicated QA team in your organization, which is honestly very important, especially if you are a software developer shipping to customers, you don't really want their, um, your nasty bugs to reach them. So please, everyone, give it up for Dana Scheider. Hi, everybody. I'm Dana. And today, like he said, I'm going to talk to you about everyone's favorite topic in software development, quality management. Um, now, I work at Envato, which is a company that may be familiar to some of you that have done web work. Um, and Envato has never had QA. So I'm going to talk to you today about how we've done this, um, what we've learned, the different approaches and pitfalls that you can take. And yeah, so I want to get started. And the first thing that I want to start with before I go into anything else is the definition of quality. We kind of need to know what quality is before we can manage it. So quality for the purpose of this talk, I'm going to define as the suitability of a product for its intended purpose from the perspective of the consumer. So for this talk, I want to think of quality in a broader way than just whether your final product has bugs or not, um, and think of it more holistically. So some of the elements of software quality that we want to pay attention to are things like functionality of the software, of course, performance, user interface or user experience, also freedom from bugs, of course, and then security, which is too often an afterthought. Um, so as we started developing this approach at Envato to manage quality without having dedicated QA employees, we realized that what we were coming up with was basically identical to total quality management, which some of you may know is an approach used, especially in Japanese manufacturing and was really popular um, from the 80s for quite a while after that. And I'm gonna talk about how you can apply TQM to development teams. Um, I wanna add the caveat that adopting these approaches, either traditional QA or TQM, uh, requires management buy-in. So if you don't have management throughout the organization on board, then you're going to struggle to get much in terms of results out of these. Um, mainly because both approaches require that time and resources be devoted to quality. And so if you have too much pressure to get stuff out the door quickly, you're not going to have great results either way. So traditional QA tends to happen towards the end of the development process. And it's focused on finding bugs, fixing them, and just going back and forth with devs, or sometimes you have embedded QAs working on dev teams. And either way, that's towards the end of the process of developing a software product. QAs typically don't influence the definition or design of the product, either visually or technically. And it's, like I said, focused on finding and fixing defects when, to me, it should be focused on overall suitability of the product for its intended use. What I will say about traditional QA is that QAs usually have training and experience that most devs don't. It's actually its own skill set. And so in order to adopt TQM, that's something that devs have to be trained in somewhat, learning to figure out how to break things, be creative about what's not going to work, and that kind of thing. So for TQM, the most important thing about it is customer focus, that we're defining quality to mean the value to the end consumer. And that means everything from the 
technical features of the app to the visual design to performance and all, you know, every element that goes into the process. Um, it also requires employee empowerment. So in a TQM approach, every single person who's involved in the development or design process, product people, project managers, developers, of course, managers, all of those people are individually and collectively responsible for the quality of the product. So it requires an environment where people can speak up without worrying about negative consequences, where people have adequate autonomy to do their jobs. They're not getting overworked or burned out and also get ongoing training to improve their skills. Um, TQM, one of the core tenets is continuous improvement. So making sure that you have the ability to do that is really important. It's based on fact-based decision-making um, and also, like I said, yeah, continuous improvement of products and processes. So I'm not a management consultant, so I'm gonna be focusing mainly on how this is implemented on dev teams um, with the understanding that in order for it to work, management has to be willing to provide the time and resources that people need to actually take the time to delve into quality issues. Um, so why should we implement TQM? My goal here is not to convince anyone that TQM is the right approach for their organization. It may be for some and not others. It may be costlier for some to adopt than others. So it's really a decision for each individual organization to make. What I like about it, some of the advantages are how it starts from the very beginning with how product specs are defined, with how the UI is designed, as well as development decisions, you know, how you're gonna implement this in code and code quality and maintainability. So it's really focused on all aspects of that. And the last benefit really is that you don't end up needing to re to issue so many patches or release new versions as often because by working collaboratively to make sure that you're focused on quality at every stage you avoid making those defects to begin with quality is always the responsibility of the entire organization and that's true kind of regardless of if you're using QA or TQM it's really important that that be emphasized throughout management, throughout the dev teams. Everybody has to be responsible for it collectively. So who can adopt TQM? I think it's possible for everyone, but for some organizations, it'll be easier than for others. So some of the factors that help make it easier and cheaper to adopt include having the total buy-in of management. Like I said, um, management has to recognize that employee resources and time are going to be a factor. So if you're not gonna have QA, that means you have to make sure that your devs and your product people and your designers have the time built into their schedules to actually focus on quality and make that a priority. Um, if you already have certain elements in place, um, it's not necessarily an all or nothing thing. So some organizations have a few of the characteristics already there and that makes it easier to continue to adopt more of that approach. Um, one thing that's really important in TQM is having frequent and multi-directional communication between functional areas. There can't be siloing, there can't be throwing things over the fence. It's, it has to be something that people are directly working together to make a quality product. Um, good automated test coverage really helps when you're making this transition to make sure that if, you, um, if you're getting rid of your traditional QA approach that there is some kind of guardrail to make sure that things don't just go to hell immediately. Um, 
yeah, management needs to provide resources and create conditions where at each point in the process, people can do their job well. And that is a change in mentality for a lot of managers who are, t who are more hands-on with their employees, who may have more direct input to how employees do their job. But honestly, if you're hiring knowledge workers, the reason for that is because they know how to do their jobs. And the role of management is to make sure that things aren't getting in their way. Um, the other thing is that employees need to not feel rushed or burned out or under excessive pressure. Some people work better under pressure than others, but in general, people who are feeling rushed and burned out are just not going to make as good a quality a product as those who feel relaxed and well rested and supported. So some organizational factors of, you know, that help TQM work better include openness and safety. To me, this is one of the most important ones. Everyone should feel comfortable asking questions and critiquing their own and others work without being afraid of repercussions for them either personally or professionally. You need to create a culture where people are able to do that. And if you bring up that, oh, this would have gone better if I had not done such and such, that that's not going to be held over your head by managers or, or you know, generate the ridicule of your peers. So people really need to have that sense of safety that um, things work sometimes and sometimes they don't. And making sure that thing, that we keep doing better is the responsibility of the whole team working together. Collaboration, not competition, um, is then the next component. So you want to have a culture where people are working together to create a quality product. This is not the job of one rock star developer, or one 10x developer, or whatever you want to call them. That approach will not work. Everyone has to be involved and everyone has to be willing to cooperate. Um, and yeah, accountability, not pressure. And then management focused on providing resources, creating conditions for success, giving people the autonomy to do their jobs and encouraging that collaboration and a focus on results. So here are some recommended practices for dev teams once you've decided to implement TQM. You want to communicate regularly with product and design. It's really great if you can even have an embedded product person on your team that you work with regularly and can help communicate those requirements. Because honestly, sometimes developers also have useful input on product design. And sometimes product people even have useful advice for developers. So getting, being willing to take everyone's feedback is really important. Yeah, safety about constructive criticism and remembering that, the, that quality is the responsibility of everyone working together at each stage. Agile rituals and practices can also really help. Doing kickoffs, for example, to choose the best development approach to solve a particular problem, that's really useful. And that prevents that from becoming a problem when you get to code review and somebody, sa somebody says, oh, I think I would like this done a different way, but at this point it's already done this way, so we're not gonna demand a change. If you have a kickoff, that kind of thing can be avoided. Pairing and mobbing is kind of the same thing. And also you can really use your retros to focus on what did and didn't go well and talk about that continuous improvement. And again, the, a blameless culture, I mean, there's been a lot of dialogue around the concept of blameless postmortems, but to me, a culture that's focused on solving problems rather than pinning them on individuals is really important. Robust code review. This is one thing that I've never seen done well enough in any of the organizations I've worked at. This is a stage where you look for bugs and 
the first thing is you want to choose at least one qualified reviewer who does not contribute code on a particular pull request. No one is perfectly objective about their own work and so you just need an outsider to take a look at it. Um, I encourage people to do manual testing during code review. Pull down the branch and test it on your machine and make sure it works. I've caught a lot of bugs that way in PRs and you just can't always get that just by reading the code. Um, and when you're doing that, you want to be thinking about those edge cases that will break it because if you don't find them, I guarantee you that your users will. Um, look at the test coverage. See if it's adequate to make sure that if you break something, it will show. Um, and remembering also another thing is that a lot of the time when we test things, we think about the happy path but the happy path is often not the one that a customer takes. In fact, at one company I worked for, we found out that only 5% of customers using the app went through the happy path. So definitely take other, other possibilities into consideration. Um, and finally on this one, I'd like to leave you with the thought that a reviewer who doesn't suggest changes is usually one who's not thorough enough. There's, you know, there are exceptions, you know, really small PRs or things like that. But generally speaking, if it's a larger pull request, then there's going to be something that can be improved and it's the job of code reviewers to find it. Tracking all your work, creating issues for small changes and making sure that those changes are reviewed and tested, I mean, even a one line change can break things and I'm sure many of us have had the experience of that happening. Post release, you want to use the same manual testing procedures as you did during code review with the final released product. Um, test it in as many environments as possible. So different operating systems, different hardware, older and newer machines. Um, if you are working on a web app, a staging environment, just try it out and make sure that it works everywhere that it might be used. And then another thing that I think has been really, really useful for us at Envato is having detailed pull request templates. And these are some of the things that we want to put into each pull request. Context, writing out the purpose of this PR in a way that somebody who doesn't know about it or isn't involved in it can understand. Obviously, you want to go into the technical changes and any considerations that you made in making those changes, um, why you did it this way instead of that way. Testing, you'll want to include sections for how has this been tested? If it's a bug, how can the reviewer reproduce the bug? How can a reviewer manually test that the changes work? What are some steps for that? That's something for devs to consider when they make a PR. I also like to have on the PR template, what could go wrong? Because as devs, we tend to be optimistic and quality management requires a certain amount of pessimism. There's always gonna be a bug. So really thinking creatively about what could go wrong is important. Security risks, same thing. And then screenshots or videos illustrating the changes. And the most important thing is a change in mentality where you don't think of the goal of a PR as getting it merged as quickly as possible, but instead to get feedback and continue to improve the quality of the product that you're putting out there. So in conclusion, total quality management approaches quality from an organizational standpoint and it requires buy-in from the top down. Some of the benefits are that it can reduce defects, improve efficiency, and most importantly, make the product overall more suitable for what the user needs to use it for. Adopting it does require allocation of resources, but often companies do find that it requires less resources than actual QA departments. Um, and finally, dev teams can make simple changes to their process to improve quality and make it an integral part of their work, some of which you can even implement without having it implemented throughout the organization. So, yeah, I hope you've gotten something out of this talk, out of 
the idea of total quality management and that some of you will be able to go on your own journey implementing quality management without QA. Thank you so much. Um, and now, floor is open to anyone who has questions. Oh, over here. Oh, hey, it works. So you mentioned that there are some organizations which could more effectively implement this than others. Mm -hmm. Are you talking like literally just the difference between like say a brand new startup versus like an established um, company or like what, what is the distinguishing factor between which organizations could or could not implement it as easily as they might want? Well, it's probably easier to implement in smaller organizations just because there are fewer people you have to wrangle into it and um, train in, in quality management techniques. But the factors that really affect it for organizations in general are organizational culture. Do you already have a culture of blamelessness? Do you already have a culture of um, safety to bring up problems? Um, do you already have adequate automated test coverage? Like just those kind of things. Awesome. Thank you very much. Hi, over here. Hey. Um, I'm curious in your experience, what's the smallest team that you've seen or worked with that's still been able to implement these things at a high level? Um, again, it depends on the... Uh, the totality of the organization, but it can really be implemented on any team provided that the team is able and willing to devote employee time to actually doing these things. Obviously things like reading PRs and testing them on your local and you know, putting together detailed PR descriptions, those things require time. And so the biggest factor isn't so much the size of the team as whether they're willing to devote that time um, I've seen it work on five person teams and now I'm on a 10 person team that's doing it. Um, so it can, you know, some form of it can work for a lot of people and you can make tweaks to, you know, to make it work better for your particular situation. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, um, one over here. Hi, uh, this is kind of, a uh, vague question, but do you have any strategies on how to go about improving your code coverage, um, your automated testing coverage, and like making sure that you have a, a good ROI on that? Um, as far as ROI, I don't. I mean, I'm a software developer, not a manager, and I, I don't, I'm not satisfied with that answer. But what I can say is that I think that I, I actually like code coverage tools. They get criticized a lot, but you know, I'm not saying shoot for 100% coverage because that doesn't usually work out as well. But having something that points out, oh, this code never runs in your tests um, can be really useful. And then the next step is just to use your judgment to make sure whatever tests you add to it are meaningful and effective. You know, not just this object responds to this method, but what does it actually do? That kind of thing. Awesome. Thank you. Hi, Dana. Over here. <laughs> Thanks for the talk. Uh, very interesting. Um, one question which kind of ties in with the first one. Um, so you had the slide with uh, things which, when they already exist, makes it easier to kind mm -hmm. of implement the TQM. Um, and you already kind of explained that probably the most important one is the culture. Mm -hmm. So my question now is what is the second most important one? Like, Let's see, um, the second most important one. The second most important one I would say is already having robust cross-functional communication um, because you just have to make sure that people are on the same page about what you're doing. And so I think that's probably the one I would say next. Yeah, um, off of that, what software do you recommend for 
employees where maybe they're not as technical, but they want to report an issue, what software would you recommend for reporting those issues and maybe what templates could they follow? Um, sometimes, well, it, it depends. I mean, and it depends on how the organization's communication is set up. I mean, at Envato, we use Google Docs all the time. Um, some, you know, we, we do have product managers who can, who can actually read certain parts of the PR template can, if you have screenshots or videos of your, on your PRs, that can be really helpful to help non-technical people understand the end product. But yeah, it really depends on what communication methods you're already using. Okay. Thank you. Um, no more questions? Well, thank you very much again, Dana. Thank and you.